This is The Shepherd, and we are in Rockford, Illinois here for the Kiss and Dead Daisies tonight. We're talking about how big it is for Rockford, Illinois. Thank you guys for, for coming. We've got uh, Doug Aldrich, and we have John Karabi with us. And uh, I know my editor is super jealous. Big fan of you know, a lot of what you guys have done. First of all, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Thank you. For people that might not know or just start to get to know you guys, Dead Daisies is a little bit different of a entity than most bands. Can you expound on that? I, I, I think, to be honest with you, um, it, it, the lineup that's touring now is the band. Um, there's been a bit of a... It, it, it's funny. David Lowy is the one that put the band together in 2012 with a, another singer named John Stevens, um, and they kind of did everything ass backwards. Usually... Um, bands will get together and find a couple buddies, you know, jam for years, write songs, get a record deal, do the club thing or tour thing, whatever, and then get a record deal and go go from there. They they kind of did it backwards. They just got together, wrote a bunch of songs, went in, recorded a record, and then decided we need a band. <laughs> So there was a few people that kind of fell along the wayside. If you look at the list, they, they, they say collective, right, whatever. If you look at the list, there's a few people that fell along the wayside to get to this point. But um, at the end of the day, too, a lot of the names that are on the list were just friends of ours that, for one reason or another, uh, we called in a pinch. Actually, even before Doug was in the band last year, we called Doug and asked him to come to, was it Australia, I think, uh, when Richard was yeah. in his motorcycle accident. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the names that are on the list are people that filled in just for a brief period of time, and then that m member that they were filling in for came back. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, this is the lineup. It's Doug, me, David, Brian, and Marco. You know what I mean? So I think we've got it situated now and, and sorted out. And, and onward and upward from here. Yeah, we're, we're definitely like, uh, you know, we're, we, we feel like starting off with a record together, getting in a room, writing and recording together, it was good, a good way to, to kind of solidify and see how it was going to turn out. We, we got really, uh, we were really happy with what we came up with for the new record. Really happy with, you know, the whole thing was recorded and written within like five weeks. Yeah, um, and it's just, it's just, it's uh, we're really proud of it. You know, it's, it wasn't like pulling teeth. We had a fun time making it. We we worked hard, but it was it was cool. And then now we've, we've I guess we've done probably uh, forty shows or I don't know something like that, maybe thirty shows. But it feels like this lineup is is it feels like we've been together a lot longer. Uh, probably because these guys had they I'm just coming in after Richard and Dizzy, but uh, we're really happy with it. That kind of answers my question. I asking how the transition has been, but it sounds like it's been smooth sailing for... You, you know, know we've, guys, we've all yeah. known each other, though, too. This isn't like meeting total strangers, you know. Um, I've known Dutch since we were teenagers in Philadelphia. Um, I've known Marco and Brian years. Doug played with Marco and Brian at one time or another in White Snake or whatever. Um, so uh, it's, it, it, it wasn't like having to figure somebody out, you know what I mean? So we're, you know, just a bunch of old friends and um, having a good time, man. It's, it's uh, The transition was easy. Now, let's talk a little bit about Make Some Noise. Nah. <laughs> that, that's off limits, huh? What are you guys most proud of about that album? What's been uh, and what's been the response? What, you know, what are there songs that are because you're up there and you're feeling it out? I'm sure about how the crowd's responding to certain songs. I I have the album. I, I first thing I was drawn to a song in a prayer, you know. But then it's which you know, I got to be honest, with you, is for some apparent reason. Um, I mean, I love all the songs on the record, but I I. It, that wasn't one of the ones that I thought everybody would be drawn to. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's not just you. I mean, almost every person we've done press with, the radio, even in, even in York, the record label, the minute they heard that song, they were like, 
that's I think that's it's because of the lyric, you know. There's a lot of that's something that I mean I, I didn't have really anything to do with the lyrics, but I was really proud of what John did on a lot of the songs. Um, just going into some some interesting subjects, you know, and he he kind of made that's a that's a story that, that he's made up, maybe he's got friends or whatever, but I mean it's a cool story and I think people just relate to it somehow, you know, and and uh, I think that's one of the reasons why that song gets attention. There was another song that didn't make the record called I Love Whores and Goat Fuckers, <laughs> but that one didn't quite make it. So this one, though, no, is the one that everybody was really, you know, I can't, I can't imagine why <laughs> that Follow that one up. That would be a follow video. I can't remember. I understand why that didn't click with you. Um, why, why join together? I mean, a great song, obviously, but is it something that's personal to you guys, or is it just, hey, that's a great jam, let's do it? No, he brought, he, John thought it would be a good song to try, and just, it's just a great tune. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I, I, I didn't think of anything else other than, he could probably explain it to you better. But there's the intro, and then, the, you know, the first verse that they sang, and then there's a little guitar solo. And then this guitar riff and the bass kick in on the, I guess it would be the second verse. Yeah. The second verse. And I, even as a kid, I heard that and I was like, that is the heaviest fucking riff, I think, ever. One of them. It just, when it comes in, it's so powerful. And I didn't realize that we could actually do the song, you know, we put our spin on it, Doug twisted the guitars, and, but we kind of kept the format pretty true to the Who version, you know what I mean? But I was just like, if we can pull that riff out and just do something with that riff, like, still do the song, but just... And, you know, so we got in and, and we started jamming it, and it just fucking came out great, you know? And, but it is one that everybody, is the minute they hear it, it's just like, everybody just starts singing sure. in the audience and it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a rock and roll celebration type of song. Yeah, yeah. It's a great tune, man. You know, and it's and, and the thing that I like about a lot of the songs that we pick, um, even on the last record, we did Midnight Moses and Evil. They're not obvious songs. You know what I mean? Like, um, Some people put thought that, that Midnight Moses was probably their song, you know, but that's what's cool about it, is that, is that finding, a, finding a song that a gem. Was, it was really cool and then putting your own spin on it, people go, damn, you know, and then they hear the original and they'll be like, oh, that's cool, but I really like the Dead Days' version. You know, so, oh, yeah? Um, that kind of thing. Well, you guys, um, you know, you guys are carrying, like, the rock and roll torch. And the way that music's evolved, at least heavy music in the last 20 or 30 years, probably the last 20 years, there's so many genres and subgenres. I almost sometimes feel like straight line it. rock and roll gets almost forgotten at times. Maybe. Is that, is that a fair statement? I, I don't know if it's been forgotten by the fans. I think the problem of it is, is that, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when we all started playing, you could turn on a radio station and they would have, you know, they'd have the classic stuff, the Beatles, Zeppelin, whatever, but they would also, you know, they would play new artists or even local bands, you know what I mean? And a, a, a lot of the avenues that a band had to connect with the bands like radio, MTV, all this, it's not there anymore. So you got to kind of, you know, I call it football term, drop back and punt, figure out a new way and like, we have a great team with us obviously uh, you know Oliver and management they're always taking photos always taking videos always on we're on Facebook YouTube like they just figured out how to utilize that and maximize social media which is the new radio and the new MTV and that that puts us in in direct contact with even more direct than the old way because now we have fans that write to us on Instagram and I, I just wrote to this girl the other day she was talking about Marco uh, how awesome Marco is and I just shot her an email and I said well hey what show are you coming to I'll try and get you passes so you can meet him and I thought she was going to have a fucking heart attack that I actually reached out to her so it's I don't, is that shutting off yeah I um, think it just has to yeah. well you know it's good the 
the um, thing that you were mentioning about, like this this kind of music, is that what you mean, like straight line rock? Yeah. I mean, it's just what we grew up loving, you know? I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, maybe it is forgotten a little bit in terms of like new bands or, or whatever. This is kind of an interesting situation because we are a new, well, it's, it's a newish kind of band and the kind of music that we're playing is not maybe what a lot of bands are doing right now. It's just straight up classic rock. Like the, uh, the last record for me as an outsider, I thought it was a really killer record with cool riffs and good tunes, good hooks and everything. And uh, it, was, it was a very diverse record. Now this record adds to that in a little bit different way. It's a little bit more kind of straight ahead, gritty, in your face, but all together, Blends really well with the, with the whole category. I don't know. It just seems like um, it seems feels right. You know, it doesn't seem like we're trying to do anything or, or bring back anything. It's just what we're into. But, you know, what we spent time working on for the record was just some riffs that we thought, hey, this is cool, man. And it's like it feels good. Not not much else thought went into it. It's organic. Yeah, yeah. It just it was. But you're right, I mean, there's not a lot of bands doing exactly what we're doing right now. In the 80s or the 70s, there was a lot of bands doing it. So hopefully we're kind of flying a flag a little bit. Yeah, it was, it was neat. I had, uh, my wife and I were listening to the album the other day, and I had a couple people just show up that uh, make people into music. And, you know, it was almost like it became a game. It was kind of fun. My wife would say, oh, this song makes me think of Aerosmith. And then uh, one of my buddies like, I kind of hear like a little ACDC a little bit in this song. And, and then it was, well, yeah, but what about Foreigner? It just, yeah. it was kind of cool. Then I looked at, you know, some YouTube things. When you hear all these things, all these comparisons, I mean, they're obviously, you must take them as compliments. I, I would guess, maybe I shouldn't guess no, that. No, no, we, we just don't think about it, really. We just, we just, you know, we were just playing music. And some of our influences definitely would come in there. But then you think it's, feels like maybe Aerosmith or whatever, and then it twists into, you know, Van Halen or whatever. It's, it's not on purpose, it's just... It's we tr on honestly, like, he just said it, uh, writing this record, recording the record, and I think that the only time that we actually started bringing up uh, influences was <clears throat> when we were... We had started tracking the album. We actually had a few other songs that were done as well. And Marty, our producer, kind of sat down and he goes, you know what, man, like, honestly, like, I think those songs are great, but there's, there's going to be a little more production involved in them. Let's just keep this straight ahead, like, ACDC meets Aerosmith Rocks meets Appetite for Destruction. Not a lot of overdubs, not a lot of shit going on, but just straight ahead rock and roll thing. We're like, all right, that's it. But for the most part, like Doug just said, we honestly don't think, unless you guys ask us, hey, I hear this influence or that, we really don't even think about it. Like, we literally just sat down, like you said, someone threw a riff on the table, and we'd go, yeah, man, that's cool, that's awesome. And we'd get into a room, start jamming with a bunch of acoustic guitars, map it out, and then track it. You know what I mean? Yeah. We Honestly, we don't really think about it. Like, you, you, you know what I'm proud of about it is that um, it's been a long time, I'll be honest with you, it's been a long time since I felt like I was part of a, a band or a team or with, with your pros, you know? This is the first time in a really long time I felt like that. Right from the get-go, when we were banging around ideas, somebody would put put their idea out there and everyone would go, yeah, that's pretty cool. And we could get to a point where we get stuck and we're not sure what to do with this and then somebody would go away, John would go away and come back in five minutes and say, guys, that, that riff, what if we did this? What if we took that song and did it, you know, or, or, or Brian would go, we should do that like a double time thing instead of, and, and everybody was really Brought involved. to the table. Every, everybody, yeah, and everyone was invested in each song and, and it felt like this is like a real band feeling, you know? With the technology that you have now and the, and the, the way that the bands are structured where you've 
most of the time you've got basically a leader in the band that's the boss, um, you have to kind of serve things up to them that they want to do, you know, and, if, and, and that's it. This was a situation where we all got invested in, in each song, and not every idea worked out. We could chuck some stuff away, but when you got five heads working together, you can come up with some bullshit. That's neat to hear, because I think just the other day, two, three days ago, uh, Dave Allison of Megadeth said something that would, I think it's almost kind of sad. He said, most great bands are dictatorships. It's just the way that it is. And, and I thought, God, I, 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 hope, I hope that's not the way that it is. Oh, and you're saying the opposite. Look who right decided right. to show up. <laughs> Mr. Brian Tishy. You guys are busy. I won't be dropped. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, but that's that's funny because, I mean, some bands, I mean, some of the, I don't know how every, every band is, but most of the bands that I've, the reason that, that you would know me is from bands that were other people's bands. I was just a guitar player. I was, or, I might be a partner with the band, but still, it was like, um, you know, like for example, White Snake. I was really happy with everything, but that's David's band. It's always been about David. It's his band, you know. And the Dead Daisies is, in some ways, you know, David Lowy's the founder and the leader of the band, but he trusts in everybody's experience and everybody's knowledge of what they do to to basically make it like let's just work together. You guys seem like you have fun. I was watching, you mentioned uh, social media. And what you said about like, you know, a fan reaching out to a fan, I feel that way. I can't believe, you know, when I, when I throw something up to get that instant feedback. Because I grew up, I'm sure most people that love music, you're just a fan at home thinking, you'll never, I'll see them in concert, I, I might see something. And, but that is, that's a totally different feeling to have. That, that close contact, it feels like at least close contact. And you guys played last night in a monsoon, did you? Over was it at Iowa State Fair? Yeah, yeah. it was pretty. Uh, it was wet. It was it was wet. Let's put it that way. I'm still drying clothes from last night. <laughs> but uh, it was it was it was cool. We had you know we had fun, man. It was cool. Good. When we walked on stage, it wasn't raining. About halfway through, it started to pour. And you know what? We were like. We're reasonably covered. The fans, was, they were all there just hanging out. Some of them had umbrellas and raincoats on, but they stuck it out, so we're like, fuck it, we're going to do the same thing. Fuck it, whatever. It's all good. I think that it's important for uh, rock and roll and then the, the legends of rock and roll and the lineage of rock and roll to stay talked about. I saw, I've seen them watch some interviews, and, and you, know, you're, you know, and you were friends with. Randy Rhodes, even as a young man, right? I mean, as a boy. Well, I, I wasn't right? friends with him. I just met him a couple of times. Out in, in L.A.? Yeah. Yeah. And what, what, did, what did you learn from him? Why, why is he special to you? Because oh, I, I mean, here we are. I think this is Dimebag's birthday. Yeah. And so we're talking about some real you know, heavy hitters. And, you know, you two in the room, we're talking about people that are, you guys are carrying the flag. You guys are doing that. But there was no, I mean, the, the thing with Randy Rhodes that I was always impressed with is that he was thing that, that impressed me was he seemed like a really a really normal guy but he was just a freaking monster guitar player and um, that was that was, seemed really cool but what was confirmed was that he was a really cool guy because when I moved to LA I met a kid who was a guitar player and we just ended we were at the, at a, the true bar, a club in Hollywood and, and, uh, and then a week, a week later he called me and said that do I want to go see Randy Rhodes play? And I was like, Randy Rhodes? You mean the guy from, the guy from England with plays with Ozzy? And he goes, no, nah, he's from Burbank. He's, I used to take lessons from him. I'm like, what? That guy's not, he's not English? He goes, no. Nah. He used to teach at this music school in North Hollywood. I was like, fuck yeah, I'll go. So we go over there, and we go back to, right, we go to the whiskey, and we walk up the stairs and the whiskey, and go to the back door, and we knock on the door, and the guy opens it kids want and up on the top of the stairs above that is where Randy was he was he called the kids name he goes hey Eddie how are you doing it was like one of his students he goes hey Eddie what's up hey let those guys in man there's a freaking moment huh yeah and I had seen I had just seen a play um, a, year, a year before in Philadelphia and um, 
so he was, I met him, I was like, man, you know, it's so nice to meet you, man. He was like, I saw you, you know, the typical thing. I saw you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He's like, cool, yeah, nice to meet you. And then we left, and we watched him play, and I was blown away again. And then a week later, and he calls me back, and he goes, man, he's going to play again tonight. You want to go? And I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we walk in, and as soon as I walked in the whiskey, he was jamming with Kevin DeBro, who had his own band at that time. That's who he was jamming with. And uh, I walk in, he goes, hey, Doug, how you doing? I was like, what? This guy, even, he remembered my name? I couldn't believe it. You know? So it, he, he was really cool. And, and like all the guys that we've got to, that we were fans of, but then later got to be either friends with or work with, or, you know, it's like, it's weird. Somebody that you had a poster on your wall of them, now you're friends with them, and they're like, they're asking you, you know, hey, What's that, what's that guitar? Why do you check out that guitar you're playing? It's like it's bizarre. <laughs> I bet it has to be. You know, you you uh, have what I've read is a real good relationship with Mick Mars. Yes. Have you guys have you guys been recording together? This is a rumor I, I did right two here. songs with him. Uh -huh. And right now, um, honestly, Mick asked me to help him write some stuff for his record. The only problem is I don't know when I'm going to be able to do it. I, I have this, which is, we're, right now, I think we're booked till fucking December 22nd, and they're already thinking of things for next year. Um, I have another solo band, I live in Nashville, so I have another solo band with my son. We've got a record coming out in October, November, so at some point I'm going to have to go do shows with that, and I'm just, I don't want to do something just to do it. You know what I mean? Like, sure. whatever. I, I want to make sure that, you know, I can put the time and effort and energy into it. You know what I mean? So, um, I actually have to call Mick at some point, you know. But, um, you know, he initially talked to me about this. Like, it was right before he left to do that final tour with Motley. And they were out for almost two years. And at that point... I was just doing my solo band, and I'm like, yeah, dude, I'll help, man, it's no big deal, and then all of a sudden, this came along, and then, you know, I did a record with my solo band, you know, and, like, so I've been busier and shit with those two things, and then there's even a possibility that I may do something uh, for a TV show, so I just gotta, I just gotta make sure that I have the time, because I, I, it's mixed first record, he's never done anything outside of mine, and I just... I, you know, I did talk to him a little bit, and I said, dude, this is your first outing. It's got to be fucking awesome. Yeah. And I don't want to be the reason why it's not. You know what I mean? So. Great respect there for him. Yeah. You know, so I'll give him a call in a couple of days, whatever. You guys did a couple of songs that sounded great. Yeah, we did two tunes. He, 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 he wrote them, I believe, with a guy named uh, Tommy Hendrickson or something from Alice Cooper's band. So... I just went in and sang them. I tweaked the lyrics a little bit. Um, you know, we'll see. I don't know. At this point, I, I don't want to say no. I don't, I don't want to say yes. I just got to see how it plays itself out. Well, one of uh, this is kind of a little bit off the beat question, but it's, it's a obviously it's a rock and roll question. I don't know if it was, and if I'm saying this wrong, is it is it pronounced Bakken Tour Festival? That's well, Basketball, I mean, in but, Europe, a lot of times they put a, a V where it's... You know, we just say wagon. You know, we just say wagon. That's how I said it. It is called Wacken, because in Germany, um, they, they switched the... the Vs. And the Vs. Yeah. So, it's, I don't know if that was that festival or not, but whatever the festival was, or the there was the hologram. Of, oh, yeah, of yeah. Donnie I think that, that was, that was it. it. Yeah. Now, some people have taken offense to that. Other people have said, what a neat tribute. Where do you guys lie on that? Was I mean, that, was I, the, is that or is that? I mean, I think I think it's kind of interesting as a, I mean, as somebody who knew Ronnie and worked with him, but also was a fan of him. I think it, I don't know that I. I think we talked about this maybe. Me and John, or me. And, I talked about somebody, Marco. I think you and Marco were talking about it. And it's like maybe the thing is is to not like do a whole show with that, but it's kind of a nice. Thing they prefer special. I don't know. I'd like to see it myself. I didn't get to see it actually, but um, 
they did say the uh, Dio Disciples were the special guests. And we were like, who the fuck is the special guest? And we were all sitting looking at the poster going, I wonder who the special guest is. And then we didn't realize that they had a, this hologram set up and they were having Ronnie come out and do, uh, it's kind of weird how I just said that, but right, yeah. they were having Ronnie come out and grab a hologram and, and do like three or four songs at the end. Something in that thing, I, I like Doug, I don't, I think it's kind of cool, you know, it's, it's it, you know, they tip the hat, whatever, and apparently I read up on that hologram company, and they're doing now, um, they're going to do the same thing for Lemmy, they're oh. going to do like a full-blown, and it takes them like a year or some shit to put it all together, and get all the footage, and whatever, but <clears throat> they're going to do a hologram for Lemmy, and do a full concert or a tribute or whatever. I don't see the I don't see the harm in it, you know what I mean? It's like it's, it's something interesting and if, if you know, if people don't have to go, you know, if they don't want to, but I I mean to be honest, I'll tell you I'll tell you the honest truth. If the Dio Disciples were playing, I would I, if I happened to be in town I might go, but it, I wouldn't be like I wouldn't tell my wife hey, I'm split to the Middle East and I'm going to go see the Dio Disciples but it was like they're playing and I know that they're going to do the hologram like I kind of want to see that you know sure. I like to see that and if, it's, and if it works it's yeah it's, some, it's an extra little piece of entertainment you know but people I think were upset because they felt like it's that Ronnie would yeah granted Ronnie would, would put, you know, the, the flip side of the coin is I know Ronnie would not be like oh, that's fucking ridiculous you're fucking kidding me you know that's what he'd be like no I'm not doing it I'm not fucking doing it I told you that's ah for a fuck's sake but then <laughs> after a week of, of Wendy telling him come on Ronnie it's really a good idea you know ah for a fuck's sake okay let me meet the fucking guys you know that's how Ronnie would be he would just be like let me meet the fucking Bring the fucking guy in, and then Ronnie would be like, "Hey, really nice to meet you, man. So, what is this technology? You know, you know, what is this technology you got going? Hologram? That sounds. Wow, that's interesting. Hey, I, okay, well, good, mate. You want a beer? You know, it'd be like, it's just, it's just technology. I don't know. I can see where some people would. Feel well, Jason's about doing kind of the same thing. Jason Bonham does like a whole Zeppelin thing, and he does Moby Dick. With his dad, like oh, a, okay. he does the same thing, like, a, but it's not a hologram. It's more of a video, but he's got it mapped out where he'll do a fill, and then John, John will do a fill back, and then they, they just kind of go back and forth, you know. And, and, and people dig it, you know what I mean? So why not? Yeah. Whatever, you know. That technology is pretty amazing, anyway. So I'd like to see it just for that, you know, that you make somebody like three dimensional, four dimensional. Well, we appreciate your time. We don't want to monopolize, monopolize. You've been really gracious with it. We also want to make sure that we mention the album is out. It came out August 5th. Make, make some make noise. Make some noise. And we're, what's the easiest way to get it? Because I went to the local Best Buy, and they pissed me off. Can I buy it tonight here at the show? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. And where if people can't make it to a show? Um, you can get it on Amazon. On, honestly, I, I do have to say this, though. The fans have been fucking amazing. They have literally pushed this record into a ton of the charts all around the world. America, Canada, Italy, France, Germany, Japan, uh, England. It's it's doing really well. Thank you for that. But um, some of the places it's just on back order. I don't think anybody saw this coming. Okay. The response that we're, we're getting. So... Um, you know, I know we had vinyl out, and I think they made like, was it 3,000 or 2,500 copies of it? And it was like, boom, gone. So they, they're redoing more, you know, okay. but so they're, they're, they're scurrying to try and catch up to demand. Uh, but you can get it on Amazon, they can download it on all the iTunes, Spotify, like all those, all those, all those things, and then we'll have them at the shows. Good deal. I, I like to have a physical copy yeah, myself. Yeah. I just, you know, we're all probably about the same age. I, I like to own it, and I wish that more young people would want to own that. Well, they, but yeah, they don't know that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's funny. Like you show a fucking kid a record right now, they're like, "What the fuck is that?" 
<laughs> it's a really large coast. Shut the fuck up. Go to your room. <laughs> it's funny you say that. I'm a, I'm a high school football coach, uh, and uh, today we had practice. We were watching the film from last night, and uh, you know we have the new technology and it broke down. So head coach said to the kid, "Go in there. Go in that other classroom and get a VCR." No comprehension. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I kid came back and said, I don't know. I don't know. Is this a VCR? And he's like, No, it's a freaking notebook. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's just it's an old you know uh, avenue that they they have not walked on. So, but you know what's cool out. that that um, they took that record, they took the, the album and put it onto two records. So it's two records in the package. So there's what three, and a CD and a CD, but there's three songs per side. Yeah, and the, the thing that made analog sound the best sounding. Analog records were the shortest records because it meant the grooves could be a little deeper and a little wider, and you get the full analog power of that song. When you got like 15 songs, you got to cut it really tight, and it's not as big. It's not as as, as big, so I know. the songs really sound like what they were meant to be on the vinyl. It's really cool. That's, so I mean, it's like if you wanted to, if you made a record that big with one song on it, it would fattest sounding thing of all. You know, right. Obviously that doesn't make sense. That's what we're going to do next time. We're going to do one a box set of one record. One record. One song on each record. It weighs 45 pounds but it yes. sounds awesome. But it fucking sounds awesome. How it's meant to be. I mean that's the thing that's bizarre is that you know you go through all the trouble. We you know we were just playing but Marty Fredrickson and, and uh, the engineers that worked on the record went through a lot of trouble to kind of just get some nice natural sounds. And then eventually it just kind of goes down into your computer and people will listen to it out of this speaker. Right, it's condensed. You know? And totally. So, but, so that's a whole other side of it too that, that um, you know, I forget what my point was actually. Duh. It happens when you get to be our age. <laughs> my point was basically that it's funny that you would go to all this trouble to uh, make, this, make the sound good and then people listen to it out of their computer speakers a lot of times. So the trick is to make it sound good there and also on a proper system. So when you listen back to it, it sounds cool. Thank you guys. You guys have been more than gracious with your time. This has been oh, this is a blast for me as a fan. I just I'm a geek right now and my oh, editor, there. you know, ha -ha, I'm here and obviously you don't have cable TV. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we appreciate what you do too, man. Keeping the, you get spreading the word about bands that you like and stuff like that it Thank helps you. us a lot you know We're, we wouldn't be able to be here otherwise yeah it's a thing this this whole thing is like a, it's like a chain letter if you tell one person that likes the band and they tell two yeah. you know what I mean sure whatever it just you know and that's that's what's been going on with this you know and, and it's it's getting bigger like excuse me bigger every day so it's, it's pretty awesome we wish you continued success and yeah, I, I can't cool. wait my my wife's on the way home from work. We can get here. They're doing a block party outside. Nice. Yeah, and they, they said Rockford never does this. This is huge for this city, and so from a local perspective, we're very thankful. And I'm glad this is going on. But like I said, I I told all the people I work with this. They have the tickets here. You got to come early. You got to come early. So to the people listening to this, you guys will be on tour for an extended time. You know, it doesn't end tonight. No. So come out and see the Dead Daisies. You can find that on Facebook. That's where I found it. You can find almost anything on Facebook. And you guys have your own website. I like yeah, yeah, as well. So dead daisies. The, the, the dead daisies dot com. Yeah. And then you can find us on all kinds of social media too. But the thing is, is we'll be on. We'll be out with Kiss for another two and a half, three weeks. We're gonna do some shows on our own, and we're gonna go. We're going to uh, Korea after that. Yeah, we're gonna. Uh, we're gonna do some U.S. U.S. social shows. US shows for the troops, so that'll be a lot just, of fun. Which is, which is really cool that, to be able to do that. Go, you know, say thanks to. Uh, I just want to ride around in a tank and blow shit up. <laughs> <laughs> just give me a helmet. I got this. <laughs> North Korea is that way? I'm on it. <laughs> well, it sounds like our international relations problems are gonna be solved with you guys over in uh, in the east. Yeah, no. Very good. Thank you guys. All right, buddy. Thank you.